Good morning, everyone. So today, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, practical Agile project management. A little bit about me. Uh, my name is Chris Stoffer. I'm the founder and CEO of Stoffer. Big shocker there. <laughs> uh, started the firm about 11 years ago. Spent about probably seven years or so kind of in the trenches writing code. Started out as an enterprise Java architect consulting for a lot of the big boys out there. Uh, built a whole lot of very large systems. And started really focusing on growing the firm right around, I'd say about five or six years ago. Uh, we're located in Playa Vista, California, and we do specialize in Drupal. We've got about uh, 14 full-time developers right now, and we pretty much handle all forms of uh, Drupal implementations. There's a couple of the clients that we work with. Uh, we've implemented Drupal for quite a few of these guys. You know, every, everything from the Los Angeles County Museum of Art uh, to USC to HBO to Cornell University. So first, we're going to talk about a little bit about how we actually work. So from a strategic perspective, we actually go out and partner with a lot of Los Angeles' best creative agencies. Because we found, you know, much to Karen's point yesterday, that when it really comes down to it, where we make a good portion of our living is really from the marketing budget. And specializing in Drupal, that definitely comes out of a marketing budget the majority of the time. Sometimes it does come out of, a, uh, out of an IT budget, but the majority of the time, the majority of projects that we work with are definitely coming out of the marketing team. So what that means to all of us in the room is that you're dealing with clients that don't necessarily actually understand how the system's development lifecycle works or really what they're getting themselves into when they start the project. As we all know, marketing people love to change their minds. That's really what they do. And if they weren't changing their mind constantly, they probably wouldn't be very good marketing people. Back in the olden days, we used to run projects using Waterfall. And that was great for then. But nowadays, trying to get marketing people to actually plan everything out to begin with and then move into the Waterfall, it simply doesn't work. It really doesn't and you end up in this nightmarish hell of change request after change request after change request after change request. And it simply, it simply is kind of the old way of doing it. So we've created uh, at Stoffer kind of our own flavor of Agile. So first we're going to talk a little bit about what Agile is. <coughs> Agile at its essence is really about going through and chopping up a project into time-bound iterations and delivering functional features in each one of those time-bound iterations. It's very much about people, very, very much. People and communication and making sure that everyone on the project actually is on the same page, going and building something rapidly and then deploying it rapidly as well. So we're gonna kind of start at the beginning of the project and then basically walk through how you should actually do it according to us. So at the beginning of any project, the most important thing to get from your client is what their actual project goals are. If you don't actually focus on what the client's business goals are and what their objectives are, then you're never actually going to be successful in the project. And a lot of times when dealing with marketing people, they know they need to get the word out there, but they don't necessarily have actual measures for that success. So once you've figured out what their goals are, the next step is to figure out what their metrics for success actually are. Because if you don't know what they consider to be successful, then how can you know whether or not you've actually satisfied your users' needs? One of the things that I think is very, very important is to make sure that you ascertain what the client's business goals are and what their metrics are for success long before you actually go out and start proposing solutions to them. One of the mistakes that a lot of Drupal people actually uh, do is they go out and they begin just kind of pushing Drupal, 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 Drupal from the beginning. Well, that's not necessarily the right way of doing it because you want to figure out what your client's needs are and then making sure that you're tailoring what you're basically talking them into 
based off what those business goals are and what those metrics for success are. Because if you don't actually know that up front, then you're not going to be able to talk them into doing anything at all. They're just going to think you're a tech guy trying to explain to them how you actually know better than they do, which that doesn't work. That doesn't work at all. It's just met with resistance. So we're going to talk a little bit about assumptions as well. When I was a kid, my mom told me, when you assume, you make an ass out of you and me. Well, that's simply not true with what we actually do these days. Because when it comes down to it, we get paid to make assumptions. That's actually what we do. When a client comes to you and says, well, Chris, can you build me this system? They don't really know what they're doing. If they did, they probably wouldn't be hiring a consulting firm to do it. So we have to go through and we do have to make assumptions every single day. However, there's nothing wrong with making assumptions so long as you write them down. You have to write your assumptions down and then simply present them to the client and validate those assumptions. And then they're not really assumptions anymore, are they? They're actually requirements for the way the system's going to be built. And that works great. If you make assumptions without clearing it by the client, pretty much all that's going to happen is you're going to end up having to redo stuff and they're not going to want to pay for it. So write them all down. <clears throat> At the beginning of any engagement, you have to come up with exactly what's going to be built. And you're going to need to go through a discovery process. It doesn't matter whether it's a fixed bid or whether it's a time and materials project, you're still going to have to go through and perform a discovery phase. At the beginning of the discovery phase, you don't really know exactly what the client wants. And so there's tons and tons and tons of options. You know, at the beginning, you basically have a white canvas and you don't really know what you're going to paint there. And then throughout the project, slowly but surely, you're going to begin narrowing what those options are and what those features are that you're going to create. To the point of where you get to the end of discovery, you actually have a roadmap and a decisive decisive answers from your client on exactly what they're going to create. This slide here kind of shows a little bit of the breakdown. Now keep in mind where those overlaps are. That changes all the time. That changes on every single engagement I've worked on. But as we spoke about before, the first thing you've got to do is come up with what the strategy is. And then once you've come up with what that strategy is and what their goals are, you're then going to begin creating the information architecture, the visual design, and the technology architecture. Moving a little bit more into Agile here, there's a few key terms that we're going to need to go over and make sure that everyone understands. The first one is a planning session. Obviously, you've got to set the expectation with your client on exactly how your project engagement is going to work, because Agile is kind of scary to a lot of people, especially if they don't actually know what Agile is. One of the fundamental principles of Agile is a daily scrum call. Basically, every single morning, you need to sit down with every single person that's on your project team for about 15 minutes. The only thing you're allowed to talk about is, what did I do yesterday? What am I doing today? And what's stopping me from doing my job? That's the only thing you're allowed to talk about during those meetings. Sprint reviews are quite crucial as well, because you're basically going to go through and show effectively what you built. Sometimes we call this the dog and pony show. You're also going to have a sprint retrospective. At the end of every sprint, you're going to need to actually go back and figure out what was working well and what wasn't. You're also going to need to come up with a burn down chart, which we'll go over in just a minute. All right, so up here we've got basically a graphic and we're going to go through each one of these sections uh, in detail about what the Agile methodology is to us. The first step is to figure out exactly who your users are. Because if you don't know who your users are, you're not going to be able to figure out how you're actually going to target them and tailor the system to them. There's all sorts of different types of users in the system. And you've got to make sure you know every single one of them. And we're not just talking about the end user or the you know, the person that's actually clicking around on your Drupal system. We're talking about every single person that interacts with that system. It could be the end user. It could be different types of end users. Different end users have different goals. 
they have different objectives. You're also going to need to make sure that you've planned out and you've written out what your clients' users are going to be. You may have customer service staff that are going to need to get access to the system. You may end up needing um, a marketing person to review content before it's published. You may need content authors. And you need to make sure that every single user that's ever going to interact with your system, you've written it down. And you've written down what their goals are and why the system matters to them. Once you've figured out who your users are, the next thing you're going to go through is you're going to figure out what those user stories are. Are most of you familiar with what user stories are? No? Well, user stories are small snippets or sound bites of what a user could do with a system. An example of a user story could be the user can log into the system. The user can reset their password. The user can search. Just small, very, very granular, very, very targeted explanations of what that user is going to do. One of the things you've got to be really careful about, especially for the developers in the room, is you're not allowed to use nerd words. Nerd words are the enemy in this sort of a situation. Because you've got to understand that chances are the person that's controlling your budget, they're probably not a nerd. And if you start saying things like, I'm going to, I don't know, um, make an Ajax request to a back-end web service that re returns back you know, a JSON string that's going to be parsed into a media rotator on the home page. They're going to look at you like you're speaking Greek because that doesn't matter to them. They don't care. All they want to know is how is the thingy going to work at a very high level from a functional perspective, from a business perspective, what exactly can the user do? A lot of times some clients get a little frustrated and they're like, well, Chris, Chris, can't we just start building it? Can't we just start building it? I really want to start building it. The pushback that I usually give to those clients is, well, what am I building? Do you, do you want me to make all the decisions on what I'm building? Or more importantly, do you want money, one of my engineers to make all the decisions as to what we're building? What if he's wrong? Are, are you going to pay for that? How hard is it to write down the user is going to log into the system? The user can reset their password. Those exercises are actually pretty quick when you really think about it. And if you think about the amount of time that it's going to take to go write code, for each one of those little user stories. What is it, 30 seconds compared to four hours? Push back on it. Make them write it all down. Because if you don't, it's just gonna burn you in the long run. Because your user, or sorry, your developers are gonna make certain assumptions that may not necessarily be documented. Well, and now we're back to what we were talking about earlier, aren't we? Not cool. So once you've created a list of all the user stories, you're actually going to create a sprint backlog. So what a sprint backlog is, it's a list of every single user story for every single requirement that's in the system. I always tell clients, I do not want you ever to assume that something's going to be expensive because the majority of the time they don't actually know how hard something is. They always think they know how hard something is going to be or how easy something's going to be. But when it comes down to it, they really don't know. And you always want to get them to write down every single feature that they could ever dream up imaginable. Because you don't want to actually code yourself into a corner. And you want to make sure that you know exactly what's going to happen for future releases of the system. With Agile, obviously, it's going to change. It will. It always changes. Every day it changes. <laughs> but when you come up with that list and that backlog, what you're going to do is you're going to have a list of every single feature that's going to happen in the system. Then you take that backlog, usually to your tech team lead or your architect, and you basically have them write down about how many hours he thinks it's going to take for each one of those features. It could be in minutes, it could be in hours, sometimes it could be in days, but chances are if you're doing it in days, you didn't actually go granular enough. Because all that means is, yeah, that you're taking a risk as a manager because you know, if it takes a developer three days to do one feature, chances are you should have actually broken it down into a smaller chunk. <clears throat> now, once you've got that list and that product backlog of every single feature that's going to go into the system, you can use different tools out there. We actually use Jira uh, with Greenhopper. Uh, it's a commercial product that's uh, done by a software company named Atlassian. 
And what that allows us to do is to create that entire product backlog as a drag and drop list. And we tell the client that we need them to organize that based on what their business's priority is. Back in the olden days, I used to say, oh, well, here's a list of requirements. I want, I want you to prioritize it, you know, ones for critical and twos for, you know, need to have it, threes are pretty cool and fours are, well, yeah, we're, we, we might not end up doing those. And every single time I do that, 75% of the stuff is a one. And then you're just like, well, no, but what really matters? Like, no, really, you, you need to tell me what actually matters. Because if everything's a one, then you didn't actually prioritize anything, did you? You didn't actually prioritize anything at all. Well, if you force the user to go in, the business user to go into that product backlog and look at it, well, now they actually have to sort every single task that's going to happen on the project according to what their priority is. There's no such thing as everything's a tie anymore, is there? Because the system won't actually let them have everything be a tie. And at that point, you really start to understand what really matters to the client. And you really understand what those hot buttons are. Now, sometimes you have to group those items, you know, in logical chunks. Like, for example, you're not going to, you know, prioritize user login and then do, like, forgot my password at the very end. Because that's just kind of silly. You know, chances are you should probably work on one functional component together all at the same time. You know, that's usually the best way to do it. And with JIRA, you can actually group uh, with subtasks, individual items. And that makes it so you can prioritize certain modules or certain features over the top of others. <clears throat> now, one of the crucial things here, and what a lot of people don't like about Agile, and what scares them about Agile, is you try and explain to them at the beginning of the project, well, what am I getting? And you're like, well, I don't know. I don't know. Well, how much money is it going to cost, Chris? Well, I don't really know because we haven't actually gone through the discovery phase and we haven't actually figured out, you know, approximately how much the system's going to cost. Obviously in sales, you can't just completely say, I don't know, because that doesn't ever really work. No one's going to buy a product when you're like, I don't know, it could be hundred bucks, could be a million. I don't know. You know, that isn't actually going to work, or at least it's never worked for me anyways. You know, I've never actually been able to pull that off. So usually you end up having to set some high level budgetary expectation during the sales process. So when someone comes to me, I'll, I'll listen to them talk for like an hour you know, or so, and I kind of write down little bullet points. And then based off skills and experience, I go, oh, I don't know, 70 grand, maybe 100? Does that sound like we're kind of in the right ballpark? You know, does that fit into your budget? And you just give them kind of a high-level ranged estimate. Then once you've got them to buy in to that high-level ranged estimate, and it is about how much you know, they're willing to spend, you need to figure out exactly how much they're going to spend. Because once you've figured out how much they can spend, you can actually go through the backlog and you can draw a little line in the sand. Because now that they've actually gone through and prioritized all those features, you can basically, you know, do the math, say, okay, well, my tech lead or architect, he wrote down, you know, that the following, you know, 100 tasks are, I don't know, 70 grand, or, or 100 grand, let's say, for example. Well, the client's budget is $70,000. So now it's actually really easy to figure out and set the expectation with the client that that right there, what was above that line, that represented their $70,000 budget. And that's actually what you're telling them they're going to get. And everything that's below that line is stuff that chances are they're probably not going to get because they can't really afford it. Now, a lot of the times they're going to, when you first show them that, and you actually walk them through that, they're going to go, oh my God, so are you going to promise me that everything that's going to go below that line, uh, or sorry, everything that's above that line is going to happen? And the answer is no. You're not actually going to promise them that. What we usually do at Stoffer is we take that budgetary line and we actually draw another line right there that usually leaves about a 30% or so pad. And then everything that goes above that line, I tell them, well, that's the promise. I promise you we're actually going to get that done because I know we're going to get that done. And it's my job as the project manager to make sure that everything that's above that threshold gets done. And everything that's below that line is what we refer to as the stretch. And I basically tell them, look, you know, a lot of those features that you wanted that were in that kind of gray area, we're going to try our hardest to actually get those done. 
But really what it comes down to, Mr. Marketing Person, how many times are you going to change your mind on me? If you decide you want to change your mind every single day, well, there goes your budget. All those things that were in that stretch, you're probably not going to get those anymore because you kept changing your mind and that forced the engineer to do it over and over and over again, which burns budget. And really to the consulting firm or from the consulting firm's perspective, it's not really fair for them to expect us to keep doing work over and over and over again without there being some consequence to their actions. And usually when you explain it like that, they go, oh, okay, I get it. So I always tell them, the less you change your mind, the more that's in that little bottom chunk section, the more that you're actually going to get. Kind of makes them behave a lot more. As we talked about, the sprint backlog is actually going to be a backlog of every single one of those user stories. We're going to set that defined budget. Then we're also going to set the defined timeline for a given sprint. Now that's a very, very crucial, crucial concept. So we're going to go back here a few slides to this guy here. So in a 30 day sprint, we're saying that we're going to take a certain chunk off the top of that backlog which was the highest priority tasks. So say we have a project that's going to be, I don't know, three months for that, you know, $70,000 engagement that we were talking about. So if you divide that up, you know, by three, I don't know, you're going to end up with a certain chunk of hours that's going to go into each one of those backlogs. So you're literally going to take the cream off the top. You're going to grab that chunk, and that's what's going to go into that sprint backlog. And that's what you're saying, look, at the end of that sprint, we're actually going to have that stuff done. That's exactly what you're going to get for the sprint. And you do the same thing about that kind of 70-30 rule. If you say in this sprint, I promise you, you're going to get this top 70%. And this bottom 30, well, it depends on how much you change your mind, doesn't it? At the end of the sprint, nothing says that those items that were in that bottom 30% can't be prioritized to go into the next sprint. Because usually you're not going to make it through all those tasks. There's going to be a few items that you're not going to actually hit. But all of those just go back into the next iteration. And that's one of the problems with the little sexy transitions. It takes a second to get through all the slides. So now we actually move into the sprint, which pretty much means, yeah, go write code, boys. We're writing code. During that time, we tell the client that it's not a good idea for us to actually change the stories that are actually going on in the system. It's not a good idea, once you've set what those sprint goals are, to actually allow them to go through and go, oh, 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 oh I changed my mind. One of those items that was on the bottom of that list, we're, we're going to put that in there now because it's not efficient to do that. Now, there are perfectly, perfectly valid reasons to say we're not going to do a given task in the sprint. That's completely legal and completely acceptable. But it's not a good idea to allow them to actually change the story of what actually goes into that sprint. And the reason is, is because then you're going to have a hard time going through and keeping with those expectations that you had set previously. Next, we're going to deploy an iteration of a working system. Now, deployment can mean a couple different things to a couple different people. You know, going with that analogy that I was talking about, or the example with the three different uh, sprints, nothing says it has to actually be launched to the public at the end of that first sprint. It could be, but it might not be. It could actually just be deployed to another environment. A lot of times with our clients, we'll set up individual development environments on the individual uh, engineers' laptops. Then we move that into a staging environment or, or, well, typically a QA testing environment where one of our QA engineers is going to go through and test everything. Once the QA engineer thinks it's solid, it'll then get deployed into a staging environment. And until you're actually ready to show the public that staging environment, that's actually what you're going to show the client. Because being blunt, you don't want to show the client something that's just busted. It's just, you'll just lose credibility. 
really, really fast. And we try and do everything we can to not actually have the client see anything until after it's gone through that QA tester's eyes. Now, a lot of people in Agile, they say things like, oh yeah, you have to have 100% transparency and let the client see everything you're doing at every single point in the project. <clears throat> if you're actually working for a company where you control all the budget, you control all the resources, and you just basically can control everything, yeah, sure, show your business users everything. Because you don't really have to, for lack of a better way of putting it, manage your face to the client. If you start showing the client busted stuff all the time, they're just gonna lose the confidence in you. And it's not really gonna go over very well. It's just gonna cause a lot of problems and a lot of pain and a lot of heartache. So generally what we do is we tell the client what we're doing with 100% transparency. We tell them every single morning during those uh, scrum sessions what we're doing. We just don't actually show them the code until after it's actually gone through that QA tester's uh, queue. Then once it's gone through the QA tester's queue and it moves into staging, fine, client, look at it. Tell me what you think. Because now it's actually to a point where it's gonna be a little bit more stable. And at least you know someone's double checked everything. Because as we all know, you know, even myself when I was writing code, I screwed up all the time. They have bugs, they're inevitable. There's nothing you can do about it. You know, it's just part of writing code pretty much. And it's not really a negative thing, it just kind of is in general. So you just want to make sure you're, uh, you're getting everything tested and then moving into the staging system. Now, at the last sprint, that deployment's actually going to end up being into the production environment. Now, once we've actually moved past the initial engagement, I usually go through and tell the client uh, during the maintenance period that we're going to end up doing the exact same thing. So I've got one client, for example, Edible Schoolyard. Uh, it's a nonprofit based out of San Francisco where we basically have a defined budget every single month. It's not a whole lot. It's not even like one developer full time or anything like that. But we're still going through with them and we're still following Agile. And we go through and we say, look, we're going to move code into production once a month. Once a month. A lot of times clients want to move stuff in faster. Sometimes it's unavoidable. Sometimes it is like you realize there's a bug or something like that. You can't really dodge that. But we still try and keep them, even after that deployment into production, on that still the same concept. And then just, you know, once a month at the end of the month, you're moving something into staging, getting the client to sign off on it, and then deploying that into production. Next thing that's also very, very crucial is the sprint review. So now we've got the code up into the production environment. Everything's live. Everything's going good. We've ushered the client through the Agile process. So we should actually talk about how that thing went because we always want to try and improve. And there's always some problems, you know, that went through. Yeah, every single time. There's, there's something that obviously needs to improve. Generally speaking, it's usually some requirement that wasn't 100% clear or maybe, I don't know, you said something in a meeting or yeah, whatever. The most important thing, though, is you get all of the players involved, everyone. A lot of the times we're working with clients where we have an executive, like, let's say, a, a vice president of marketing. He or she's really too busy to actually be involved in the project day to day. So they may actually assign a product manager to you uh, that's supposed to be representing the client. Now, I said earlier in the conversation that we go through those daily scrum calls and we also go through and have a sprint planning session. Well, at that sprint planning session, you're gonna to wanna to make sure that, that the person that's at the top of the food chain, the person that actually signs the check, you kinda of gotta make them show up to those because you need to set that expectation with the person that's gonna write the check, what they're gonna get when they do write that check. Then you have to get them to delegate to that product manager to actually show up every single day during those scrum calls. But then after you've deployed the system, when you're going through the sprint review, you want that stakeholder back there again. Because now, well, being blunt, <laughs> you need to get the money for what you just actually did. And going through that sprint review and making sure that the budgetary stakeholder understands everything that happened on that release, and they know everything that went wrong, and they know everything that went well. It's just gonna make it easier 
to basically talk them into the next sprint planning session. So from a sales perspective, you always want to go through and review everything with that budgetary stakeholder. Because <laughs> usually what's going to end up happening is that product manager and that sprint review, they're going to go through and go, oh, 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 I, I, I really wish we could have done this. Or, oh, I thought of this during the middle of the sprint, but Chris wouldn't actually let me put that into uh, the product backlog. Or, sorry, the sprint backlog. Because you're not supposed to change what's actually in that sprint backlog during the middle of the sprint. And all of those different issues and all those different things that they're saying they wish they could have had, they always seem to show up in that sprint review every single time. Which, from a consulting firm's perspective, now that you've got the system stable and live, if you did your job right, the client should be giving you a high five and be pretty happy, you know, overall. And if you're going to be talking somebody into something, the best time to ask for money is when they're happy. So you're going to go through that sprint review, come up with all those other things that they said they wish they could have gotten in there. And that's when you're basically going to pitch them and sell them on the next iteration. And then you're going to go right back into the cycle again. And you're going to go right back into that next sprint planning session. And then the cycle repeats, God willing, indefinitely. Because then you just keep working on the system and you keep billing the client and you keep ending up with that happy client. So that's basically the walkthrough. Any questions?